um, okay, so we have begun recording. Um, I also want to mention that there is now live transcription uh, feature available in Zoom. So that button lives along the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you wanted uh, captioning today, you can certainly click that. So today we're very excited to have John Stewart present Exploring the Life of Lieutenant Colonel William Ledger. Uh, there's a lot to uh, cover and unpack when we talk about uh, William Ledger. And um, we are going to talk about that and uh, hear a lot about him today and his life and his work, even leading up to the American Revolution. So John uh, Stewart writes for Writes Tossing Lines column, and that's a, a column that's published in The Day, which is a New London regional newspaper. Uh, and John grew up on and around Fort Griswold uh, in Groton, Connecticut. And so he's become a lifetime student of the fort's history and a passion of his, and he's now a resident in nearby Waterford. And we are really lucky to have him share his knowledge about uh, William Ledger. So welcome, John, and please take it away. Thank you, thank you very much. Let me bring up my uh, program here. One second. There we go. How's that look? Is that working? If you want to just, uh, yep, perfect. Excellent. Okay, can you hear me also? You seem to be uh, muting out. Yep, I'm going to mute myself. You're good to go. Uh, take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Well, welcome, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining me today to explore the life of my favorite uh, Connecticut historical figure, Lieutenant Colonel William Ledger of Groton. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, I'm now in my 10th year, actually, of writing my, my column called Tossing Lines for the Day. And, you know, as part of that, um, I've researched and written several columns on Colonel Ledger and Fort Griswold. Uh, and I've always been guided by a curiosity for unique perspectives uh, that no one has yet explored, perspectives that bring the personal side of uh, history to life. In my writings, I've covered things such as the Colonel's mindset as an American merchant on the morning of the last day of his life, um, the hasty burial of the many British casualties uh, in shallow graves at the fort um, after the Battle of Groton Heights, uh, the fate of the Colonel's wife, Anne, and their children after Ledger was killed at just 42 years of age. And I've also written about the odd fact that the Colonel's uh, probate record listed only one book. Uh, very strange, I thought, for a man of his stature. And most recently, I discovered the Colonel's tooth, an upper molar to be exact, uh, was stored at the New London County Historical Society. Um, my wife thought I was crazy to be so fascinated, but uh, uh, I ended up tying this kind of a bizarre artifact to a column on historical uh, skepticism, believe it or not. Uh, I'm also finishing up a book on William Ledger's personal life, which provides the basis for this presentation. Uh, this slide uh, you're seeing now shows the imposing grave monument of Colonel Ledger in his uh, namesake, Colonel Ledger Cemetery in Groton. Uh, the Colonel's a favorite subject of mine um, because growing up in the city of Groton, I was surrounded by so many signs of him um, Fort Griswold, as you see in this slide, uh, was one of our playgrounds growing up. And I attended two different Colonel Ledger Elementary Schools, Groton Heights Elementary School that uh, overlooks Fort Griswold. Uh, and my childhood home on Mitchell Street um, sat kitty corner to Ledger Avenue. Um, and throughout my uh, childhood, you know, I could always see the Colonel's uh, grave monument right from my backyard. So. He was always there. Uh, in fact, uh, Colonel Ledger's Cemetery was another of our playgrounds. Uh, and we would often stop at the uh, Ledger family plot pictured here, surrounded by its imposing black iron fence with the post resembling cannons and uh, topped with cannonballs. Uh, I could also walk from my home to the wonderful Build Memorial Library uh, right next to Fort Griswold, where I first acquired a love of books and where Colonel Ledger's historic sword is kept. 
so the Colonel's been part of my life since uh, very early on. And now decades later, I still find myself uh, immersed in the history of uh, the Battle of Groton Heights um, as I continue to research and write columns uh, about our local history. Now, not long ago, I began to ask myself, you know, how did I, with such an intimate connection to the Colonel, and you know, having read the many histories of the fort and the battle, how did I get to be over 60 years old and still know so little about William Ledger's personal life. Uh, I had read he was a merchant, but really no account I ever found offered any details beyond that. You know, no one wrote about his life. Um, and yet I, I've been wondering for some time now, you know, who was William Ledger? I decided it was a long time to answer that question, long past time to answer that question now. So I've got a lot to cover today. So hang on, if you will, for kind of a whirlwind tour through the socio-political life uh, of this merchant of Groton Bank. You know, he was a true patriot who gave his life in Connecticut's only revolutionary war battle. Now, outside of his dramatic death at the hands of the British, history has long ignored the personal life of William Ledger. You know, for 240 years now, no one really has considered the details of his life as a merchant, a legislator, a husband, and a father of nine children. Now, he's rightly considered a hero because he gave his life in war, but few today know who he really was and what he really had to lose on September 6, 1781, when New London and Groton came under attack. And no one has considered him a man whose, whose fate was fairly predetermined at birth. You know, his life essentially was hijacked by the momentous political events of his time. Uh, for throughout his entire adult life as a merchant, he was coerced by commercial and political turmoil out of his control. There was 15 years of punishing parliamentary laws, targeting American merchants like himself, and then five years uh, for the, the ensuing war, uh, the, kind of the preparation for war uh, here in America that eventually took his life. For those of you who don't know the dramatic story of uh, Ledger's death in the Battle of Groton Heights, quick recap. It was September 6, 1781, when the Colonel and about 150 men uh, defended Fort Griswold and Groton against six to 800 British troops under the direction of traitor Benedict Arnold. Arnold had come to impress his new king by punishing New London for its privateering successes against British shipping. And while he was here, he decided to attack the Groton Fort too. With hundreds of British troops standing in formation outside the walls of Fort Griswold, Though tremendously outnumbered, Ledger refused two offers to surrender, resulting in a short, intense 40-minute battle, after which the British swarmed into the fort and began a systematic massacre of the defenders who had by now laid down their arms. But the British had warned Ledger of no mercy, and they were true to their word. Commentail has it that, to end the carnage, Ledger marched up to the British commander and offered his sword hilt first and surrender whereupon the officer accepted it and immediately plunged it through Ledger's chest, killing him. This uh, slide you're seeing now is the parade ground uh, within Fort Griswold where the massacre took place. And the small fenced area is where the Colonel reportedly fell. Although his manner of death seems to be his primary historical legacy, if we intend to honestly commemorate his sacrifice as we sincerely attempt to do every year in Groton, uh, we owe it to his legacy to learn who he was and what he had to lose when he refused to surrender back in 1781. So I spoke with uh, historians and researchers and teachers and museum docents and others, and it struck me how outside of the colorful story of his death, nobody seemed to know much about William Ledger's personal life, which perhaps makes sense uh, since there exists no record of his business or his uh, personal life. The British burned the uh, New London Custom House in the 1781 uh, attack and all local shipping records were lost. Uh, and it seems they also torched the ledger's businesses as they rampaged through Groton Bank. You know, and also the Colonel left no journal or collection of personal correspondence for subsequent generations to learn of his life. The result is that history remains focused on his death where the Battle of Groton Heights is pretty well documented. But aside from that, you know, historians in most of their accounts will simply make a statement like, well, little is known about the early life of William Ledger. Now, though there were bits and pieces uh, of the Colonel and his family scattered about the historical record, you know, researching Southeastern Connecticut merchants uh, is a challenge. 
our venerable historian uh, from New London, Francis Manwaring Calkins, spoke of this in her History of New London, published in 1895, and I'll quote, uh, with respect to the early commerce of New London, all that can be given will form but a series of fragments. In the entire absence of all custom house records or shipping lists, the utmost a historian can do is seize and transfix those gleams and shadows that flit occasionally across the view in the investigation of other subjects. And that is how it is when looking uh, for clues into William Ledger's life. So in searching for a new and deeper understanding of the man, the only way to know William Ledger is to find those fragments and gleams and shadows and consider them in conjunction with the world of his fellow Connecticut merchants on the road to the American Revolution because that was William Ledger's world. Merchants like Ledger were the initial instigators of American discontent. Dr. John Jameson, social historian and founder of the uh, American Historical Association called history a stream of causation. And that's a concept I've used to imagine the life of William Ledger. British trade laws provided a steady stream of causation. And as a merchant, Ledger's life was shaped by those laws and their repercussions drew him into the America's fight for freedom. Um, William's father, John Ledger, was also a Connecticut merchant, and some of his records survive, offering a window into the Ledger mercantile world. And as is so often the case, to know the son, one must know the father. Uh, John Ledger was an ambitious man who emigrated uh, with his parents from England to Long Island, 1717, when John was 17 became a Latin teacher there and then a trader before marrying Deborah Youngs, uh, the daughter of a prosperous judge. John and Deborah moved from South Old Long Island to Groton in 1727 and established a home and wharf on the bank of the Thames River, close to the intersection of School and uh, Thames Street today. John wisely chose, chose a spot next to the ferry that transported people, goods, and livestock between Groton and the growing port of New London. This image shows the approximate original ferry uh, location today, um, uh, across Thames Street from the uh, Avery Kopphaus Museum. Um, and that of course is New London right across the river. Uh, 10 children were born in the Thames Street home, five boys and five girls. In 1738, John made a very profitable trading trip to England and used the profits to add a, a warehouse and shop next to his wharf on the Thames River, expanding the family business the boys would one day, uh, one day take over. Uh, John was a good public servant, served many years in the uh, Connecticut Colonial Assembly. Um, and then when uh, Deborah, his wife died in 1747 at age 43, when William was just nine years old, uh, John quickly married Mary Austin Ellery, daughter of a wealthy Hartford merchant and widow of John Ellery, uh, who was also a, a successful Hartford merchant. A few years later, they moved to Hartford, where John continued trading and became a judge and one of Hartford's wealthiest citizens. Uh, he was generous with his money, donating towards the creation of uh, Dartmouth College in New Hampshire and many other causes. Um, so considering the father, William had the guidance of a well-to-do, you know, politically connected father and learned from his example of public service. When William was born on December 6, 1738, Rotten Bank was a very small village of wharves and shipyards nestled around one main street that followed the river. The, uh, the monument you see in this photo um, wasn't built actually until 1830, but the slide gives you a, a feel for how sparsely populated uh, the village was. And Groton was by then an established seafaring town, having been launching ships into the Thames River since around 1683, decades before John and Deborah uh, arrived in Groton and uh, some 55 years before William was born. New London across the river would become the second busiest port in uh, Connecticut. In some years, hundreds of ships would sail from London on trading voyages, uh, including ledger ships. Uh, Ledger family friend and famous uh, colonial uh, diarist, Joshua Hempstead of New London uh, wrote in his journal, and I quote, I came over on the ferry early. There was above 20 vessels in the harbor, mostly bound to the West Indies and several of them, sa several of them sailed this day. Um, so the Thames was indeed a busy harbor uh, in William's time and growing up among 
shipwrights and dealing with his father's mercantile customers helped shape the merchant uh, Ledger would become. I've yet to discover the level of William's education, but regardless of where he was schooled, uh, his educated father, a former teacher uh, and a man of culture, uh, no doubt made sure that uh, William received a well-rounded education, both in the classroom and at home. I do know he didn't go to Yale as many of his uh, money peers did. So young William would also uh, have begun training with the Connecticut militia at around uh, 16 years of age, as was required of all citizens. Yet he would uh, continue to remain unranked until the impending war. As far as his personality was concerned, um, Ledger has been described in, in speeches commemorating the Battle of Groton Heights as a man of fine form, a man of uh, good education for the time, unassuming in his manners, um, possessed of great executive ability, and one who could be depended upon in cases of emergency. He certainly proved that right. Um, others have called him easygoing, affable, amiable, um, brave, generous. Um, and they kind of paint a picture of a fairly congenial, uh, good man. Uh, the Colonel was also a devoted father who loved his children very much. Fanny Stewart of uh, London, a friend of Ledger's oldest daughter, Mary Ann, uh, wrote to her friend, Lucretia Hubbard in Norwich, uh, very soon after Ledger's death in battle in 1781, saying of the grieving Mary Ann, uh, and I quote, oh, think of her distress to have such a tender, indulgent parent called into an instant and endless eternity in such a shocking manner. Um, this represents at least one affirmation of William as a loving parent. Um, when John and Mary moved to, from Groton to Hartford, it seems the boys were left to run the business in Groton. Ebenezer and William as merchants and older brothers, John Ledger Jr. and Young's Ledger as ship's captains for the Ledger's West Indies trade. The remaining brother, Nathaniel, would become a Hartford physician. Though the details of the ledger shipping business on Groton Bank went up in smoke, uh, we can reasonably surmise that William's mercantile world was similar to his father's and other Connecticut merchants of the time. There's no reason to believe it wouldn't have been. Uh, John Ledger's account book for six, 1761 to 1772, now at the Connecticut Historical Society, actually speaks volumes about the ledger trading businesses. Well, the ledgers and the fellow Connecticut merchants traded with uh, Barbados, Jamaica, Tortuga, Guadalupe, uh, Dominica, and uh, many other uh, Caribbean islands. They even traveled to Madeira, an island off the coast of Africa that produced one of America's favorite wines, a wine that was in abundance at Continental Congress sessions and used to toast the Declaration of Independence. William and Ebenezer Ledger no doubt shipped many of the same goods listed in their father's uh, account book. Sugar, beef and pork, farm produce like corn, cheese and butter, uh, timber products uh, like pine boards and barrel staves and rum and molasses. They'd likely ship anything that would fit in the hold, I suppose, and bring a profit. Um, the Ledgers would also order things through each other. Uh, for themselves, their customers, or for their uh, for sale in their shop on Thames Street. This is an order uh, William placed with his father for barrels of flour and pork and uh, a handful of other things. Um, along with the West Indies ventures, ledgers would trade locally along the coast and purchase European goods at the larger ports of Boston and New York. William's probate record shows he acquired imported goods like expensive Queensware place settings from England. And Anne had a considerable stock of uh, imported fabrics, among other things. John Ledger's account book uh, also has many references to tea, the very product that would later ignite the revolution. A 1778 letter I found at the Connecticut Historical Society uh, from William and Ebenezer to Hartford merchant William Ellery uh, mentions tea, along with pricing, profits, and other cargo, uh, providing further evidence of the goods the Ledger's carried. Colonial Connecticut also led the uh, nation in exporting horses and cattle. And uh, Father John's account books show that he and William were involved in exporting horses to the islands. In fact, William's brother, Captain John Ledger, once lost 17 horses and 40 sheep overboard in a tropical storm. But it was the products at the heart of the American Revolution, um, sugar, rum and molasses from uh, the West Indies and tea from England, 
all staples of William Ledyard's livelihood that placed him at the crux of revolution. Another important part of William's world was the monetary and barter systems in place in the colonies, requiring detailed and accurate record keeping. Gives us a feel as to the wide variety of uh, transactions William dealt with during his business day on Thames Street. Um, John, rec uh, John Ledger's records show that payment might be uh, made in some form of cash, bartered goods, services, labor, and even the labor of the debtor's uh, slaves or uh, maybe borrowed livestock like oxen to be uh, to perform work for a specified period of time. In this slide, Dr. Benjamin Gale uh, pays John Ledger's for goods received through care and medicines. William Ledger would have spent much time at his desk. And his account books, had they not uh, been destroyed, no doubt would have mirrored his father's in uh, goods sold and types of payments received. So the Ledgers were indeed merchants. And as such, William Ledger um, was destined uh, to be swept up in the tumultuous buildup to the revolution as oppressive British trade laws began to pummel American merchants. In fact, William Ledger's entire adult life would be guided by social and political forces out of his control it all began in 1761. William had just turned 22 years old and had been no doubt one of Connecticut's most eligible bachelors, at least until he married 16 year old Ann Williams in her uh, family's Stonington home pictured here. William brought Ann to Groton Bank to live just a short walk from the ledger business. By this time, Britain's intrusive writs of assistance, uh, similar to today's search warrants, had been an ongoing annoyance uh, to colonial merchants uh, since they allowed inspection of merchant vessels for smuggled goods with very little probable cause. Many merchants were smuggling. It was during Ledger's first year of marriage that John Adams heard James Otis, a Massachusetts lawyer and political activist passionately argue before Boston judges against those risks of assistance. Adams would later declare then and there the child independence was born. Therefore, according to John Adams, American unrest actually began with James Otis's speech in 1761 when William Ledger was a 22 year old newlywed. But for now things were quiet. Ledger was a busy merchant making good money and hoping to start a family. The following year brought tragedy to the Ledger family and business when William's older brothers, Captain John Ledger and Captain Young's Ledger both died from smallpox while on separate trading runs to the Caribbean. John was 32 years old and Young's was 31. The losses added another duty to William's task list. For now, he and Ebenezer had to find trustworthy uh, and capable captains for ledger ships sailing to the West Indies and along the coast of New England. In 1763, life was pretty good for William, uh, especially when Anne, now almost 19 years old, gave birth to their first child in February daughter Mary Ann after two years of marriage. American merchants were thriving, but when the French and Indian War ended that year, Great Britain was left with considerable debt and would now begin to look to the American colonies for economic relief targeting merchants. American rebellion was just around the corner as Britain passed the Sugar Act in 1764, first real revenue act aimed squarely at American merchants. The Sugar Act placed an excessively high duty on non-British sugar, banned completely the importation of foreign rum, and imposed new duties on Madeira wine, molasses, and other items ledger ships carried. Boycotts and protests erupted, complaints were sent to the Connecticut Colonial Assembly by Groton and New London merchants, and trade slowed considerably. In the same year as the Sugar Act, Ledger and his fellow merchants were slammed with the Currency Act. Britain's way of straightening out the messy monetary system in the colonies. Now, the Currency Act established the pound sterling as the only acceptable payment for goods, a serious blow to American merchants and their customers since cash was so limited. Hit with these two detrimental acts of one year, the colonies erupted in protest, turning to boycotts of British goods in retaliation. William Ledger, now 25 years old, married for three years with a small child was surely concerned about its financial future. Adding to the angry debates of uh, 1764, an even greater storm arrived the following year when Parliament passed the notorious Stamp Act. The act threatened to put most American merchants out of business, directly impacting the ledgers. 
It was intended to both raise revenue for Britain and to assert the king's power over the colonies. It represented a direct tax uh, on the colonists who had no say in parliament and no way to defend themselves, which was soon to become America's mantra of taxation without representation. The act required the purchase of stamps to be placed on 55 different types of documents. Any document without a, a tax seal uh, was declared illegal, non-binding in business transactions and inadmissible in courts of law. Like all merchants, William Ledger's business was paperwork intensive. Uh, he documented orders and exports uh, from around the state, negotiated prices. He arranged and recorded payment agreements, uh, sent bills, protested fees, dealt with insurance agents in the larger ports of Boston, New York, and uh, New Haven. Um, and now all this, all this correspondence was heavily taxed, placing an impossible financial burden on American merchants like Ledger. In the history of New London, Calkins notes, the commercial prosperity which visited the country after the peace of 1763 was suddenly interrupted by the Stamp Act. It was a temporary cessation of all kinds of business. According to the book, The Stamp Act, Prologue to Revolution by Edmund and Helen Morgan, New England merchants could not have obeyed it stayed in business. Trade came to a standstill and New London merchant Nathaniel Shaw wrote to a fellow merchant in Philadelphia, I really do not know what to do with my vessels. The stamp master for Connecticut, Jared Ingersoll of New Haven became the most hated man in the state, was hung in effigies in cities and towns, including New London, where Ledger must have been present. Meanwhile, the Sons of Liberty uh, and their aggressive policies were spreading through the colonies. Uh, and in December, two meetings were held in a New London tavern, first actions in organizing national resistance in the buildup to revolution. William Ledger likely joined fellow merchants and Sons of Liberty members, Nathaniel Shaw and Thomas Mumford, at these critical meeting, uh, meetings, excuse me, where treason was in the air. In the Stamp Act, the Morgan State, the intercolonial union begun at New London continued to grow as the Stamp Act was repealed. The colonies were showing signs of united strength, something they would never forget and would capitalize on when the next trade restrictions were enacted. Ledger's fellow citizens were so fired up, <clears throat> one source claimed that in Connecticut, men of 80 are ready to gird the sword. The very boys, as well as the hardy rustic, are full of fire and at half a word ready to fight. William Ledger's life was becoming revolutionary, sweeping him up in the momentum of the cause. Now, like other towns, Groton signed a boycott agreement against British goods, forming the Groton Safety Committee to oversee adherence. Um, Ebenezer Ledger was selected to be a member. But, but now shipping was drastically curtailed and cash had become uh, had practically disappeared from circulation. The ledgers were surely struggling. As American protests heated up, the violent Sons of Liberty became a driving force in the colonies. They captured Ingersoll, dragged him before the Connecticut Assembly to publicly resign. Ledger surely read news accounts of the Sons' rampages in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Boston as they forced officials to resign their commissions or promise not to fulfill their duties. Houses were damaged, their contents looted, and artwork was destroyed or stolen. And homeowners were forced to flee for their own safety. Uh, but by now, Ledger certainly recognized that the Sons of Liberty had turned the tide of revolution from the merchants' original trade protests now to taxation without representation, a more popular cause with the general population. Uh, merchants had essentially lost control of the fight, and William Ledger's future was now in the hands of the radical Sons of Liberty. When the Stamp Act was first passed, Ann Ledger was about seven months pregnant with her second child, a daughter to be named Sarah, who would enter the world on May 6, 1765, less than two months after the act began causing hate and discontent uh, in America. William was now 27 years old with a growing family as he struggled with Britain's relentless trade policies. The battle over the Stamp Act raged on into the following year until Britain finally capitulated to the chaos, the chaos it created and repealed the act in March, 1766. The repeal of the Stamp Act led the Ledgers to experience yet another family tragedy when William's younger brother, Dr. Nathaniel Ledger was killed in Hartford. 
the Connecticut General Assembly uh, had declared an official day of rejoicing over the Stamp Act repeal and all the colonies were celebrating. Flags were raised, cannon fired in the harbor and all that going on. Um, but on June 1st, Nathaniel Ledger joined a group of men in Hartford across the street from the old Flag Tavern uh, preparing a fireworks display. Terrible explosion occurred, killing six men, including Nathaniel. One can imagine the Ledger family traveling from Groton to Hartford to lay Nathaniel to rest in the ancient burying ground uh, where he resides today. And then came more acts aimed at the merchants. Declaratory Act of 1766 asserted Parliament's uh, authority to pass binding laws on colonies, which meant the power to tax, another threat to merchants and the Ledgers. At the end of 1766, days ahead of their fifth wedding anniversary, Anne and William's third child, William, was born. Then in 1767, the Townsend Acts came along, imposing 72 more duties, further squeezing American merchants and the ledgers. Uh, newspapers wrote of the present alarming scarcity of money and con uh, consequent stagnation of trade. Connecticut towns, including Groton and New London, drew up more boycott agreements. You know, many products became scarce, and stock in most merchant shops was dwindling, including the ledgers on Thames Street. The business climate in general was miserable. Committees were assigned to investigate inbound cargoes for boycott violators, and in Groton, Ebenezer's uh, safety committee was responsible for inspecting ship manifests uh, to ensure boycott compliance. Now, William was uh, 28 years old now with three children at home. The merchants kind of struggled along in that environment with protests becoming more volatile until three years later, when the unrest led to the Boston Massacre. As a militiaman, I'm sure William Ledger read newspaper accounts of the massacre uh, with great concern as war seemed to grow closer. American trade had been uh, pummeled for six years now and his business was certainly feeling the effects. While he continued dealing with commercial and political turmoil, his fourth child, a daughter uh, named for his mother, Deborah, was born. Deborah joined Mary Ann, Sarah, and William. Then in 1771, William's father, John, died in Hartford at age 71. He was eulogized as a citizen of great distinction and influence, a man of literary culture, and a person who served many years in the colonial assembly, a man of uncommon abilities, of a clear and quick discernment, one who had proved himself a man of inflexible integrity. William was 32 years old when he and his family made the trip to Hartford to bury his father, also in the Amer um, ancient burying ground. Two years later, in May 1773, Parliament passed the infamous Tea Act, giving the East India Company a virtual monopoly on tea imports and sales in the uh, colonies. The Tea Act angered all merchants who dealt in tea, and even those who didn't, uh, for it represented the growing threat of British power over the colonies. John Ledger's account book shows the Ledger's dealt in tea, as did other New London merchants. And as we now know so well, uh, protests over the Tea Act grew, uh, culminating in the Boston Tea Party on December 16, 1773. Uh, it was during that volatile year that William Ledger was first called upon to represent Groton in the Colonial Assembly. And during that time, towards the end of June, the Ledgers welcomed another son, John Yarborough Ledger, into their home. Ledger had turned 35 years old a week before the explosive Boston Tea Party, and he found himself still living in political and commercial turmoil after 12 years, ever since his marriage in 1761. His family had now grown to five, three girls and two boys. The oldest, Mary Ann, was now 10 years old, and the youngest, not quite six months. Though still an unranked militiaman, as a community leader watching American discontent grow, William's thoughts must have been turning towards his military responsibilities, even as he headed to the Colonial Assembly in Hartford, following in his father's footsteps. Violent protest in the cities was increasing, uh, and everyone awaited the King's response to the Tea Party. And the King did indeed respond, causing more major damage to the trade of New England and the Ledger's business when in 1774, Britain closed the port of Boston to punish Bostonians and increase British control of the colonies. The tea boycotts and protests continued, uh, including a riotous uh, gathering on the parade in New London. Uh, 
having served in the Colonial Assembly the year before, uh, the participants in the uh, New London protest were Ledger's former con uh, constituents. He must have been present at such a politically charged event. Through all the unrest, Southeastern Connecticut was on the brink of commercial disaster because according to Calkins, New London had nothing but her commerce. This was her life, her all. Well, it was also Groton's all and the Ledger's all. Mid-1774, Groton followed Sam Adams' recommendation from Boston and formed a committee of correspondence where pledges were exchanged to stand by other towns and to adhere with constancy to the cause of liberty. Meeting attendees proclaimed British actions now directly threatened life and property. William Ledger was appointed to that committee of correspondence. Groton soon also pledged support for a Continental Congress uh, as the colonies were boldly headed towards self-government. While Connecticut shipping continued to suffer under the protests and boycotts, bankruptcies were becoming common. Uh, this had to weigh heavily on Ledger and the danger of martial law conditions now established in Massachusetts had to be equally concerning. His former backup army was essentially becoming the enemy. He also had to be concerned for the welfare of his young family as things were heating up. Dinner conversations with his wife, Anne, on what is now Pleasant Street in Groton must have been full of politics and concern. Early 1775 brought the General Restraining Act, uh, requiring New England colonies to trade exclusively with Great Britain. It also banned colonists from fishing in the North Atlantic, a serious blow since fish were a critical export for New England merchants. But none of this would matter when in April, the shot heard around the world was fired in Lexington, Mass, and the animosity between America and Great Britain reached a critical juncture. Lexington turned William's world toward the military. You know, when as, as someone who was uh, the community looked to for leadership, he became involved with improving fortifications on both sides of the Thames River. Now 37 years old, he had been with the Connecticut militia for 21 years. By the end of uh, 1775, excuse me, <clears throat> we can look back and picture the chaotic previous 11 years, with ongoing boycotts, non-importation agreements, uh, petitions issued to the king, smuggling, uh, American ships by then were being seized by the British. Uh, there were protests in the streets, tar and featherings and so on. Um, and Ledger's life by this point um, from age 25 to now 36, which should have been a time for, for gathering considerable wealth as a successful merchant, but his life had been lived in the midst of commercial and political upheaval. His business constantly threatened. Now in the prime of his life, William Ledger's world was in an uproar as he entered America's now famous year of 1776. The year began with a ruckus when Thomas Paine's Common Sense was published in January. In his book, John Adams, author David McCullough writes that common sense was a call to arms, an unabashed argument for war and a call for American independence, something that had never been said so boldly before in print. George Washington declared, I find common sense is working a powerful change in the minds of men. At that time, the colonies also declared open trade with the world, kind of signaling an official break with Britain. William Ledger must have read Common Sense and then followed the exciting news in March 1776 when Washington forced the British um, to evacuate Boston. It must have been exhilarating for Ledger when the revered general stopped in New London on April 9th on his way to New York, spending the night at Nathaniel Shaw's. Shaw was a wealthy and well-connected merchant uh, who served as agent for the colony of Connecticut and the Continental Congress. A few days after Washington's visit, he would be appointed naval agent for the Port of New London, responsible for all warships arriving and departing the Thames River Harbor. Shaw and Ledger were both leading citizens of their respective towns and likely had a good relationship. And that's something I plan to explore, uh, explore in the future. Um, but while in New London, Washington inspected uh, local fortifications and conferred with the local council of safety at the Shaw Mansion. Though still unranked, it would only be three months before William Ledger would be promoted to captain of an artillery company and later made commander of Fort Grizzle. He was an up and coming mil military leader who was surely part of the general's escort. Plus as a past member of the uh, Colonial Assembly and having served on Groton's 
governmental committees. He certainly attended any meetings that were held. It would have been inspiring for Ledger to have met the great George Washington, whose reputation soared after his success uh, in Boston. And also General Nathaniel Greene, another major figure in the American Revolution, was all uh, in New London on that night. Um, and during the war, William Ledger was so respected and connected to events that he corresponded directly with French General Rochambeau, most often on intelligence matters. Uh, and Washington was aware of Ledger's efforts. Shortly after uh, General Washington's visit, Ledger was appointed to a second term in the Colonial uh, Assembly. 37 years old, he headed back to Hartford with all out war looming. Congress was now debating and revising the Declaration of Independence, and Ledger must have recognized the historical implications of the moment and the military response it would demand. He was appointed captain on uh, July 3rd, 1776, and the very next day, um, July 4th, as we all know, the Congress adopted the Declaration of Independence. So William Ledger, now fa a father of seven children, was essentially caught up in world events bigger than any one man or merchant. On August 2nd, delegates began signing the Declaration of Independence and the colonies were fully committed to a fight for their lives. Everyone, including Ledger, knew America had passed the point of no return and that those at the top could well be signing their own death warrants. By the end of 1776, Anne Ledger was pregnant with their seventh child. The period between 1777 and 1780 for William was spent mainly trying to improve the defenses on both shores of the Thames River while struggling with money and manpower and food shortages. Uh, September of that year was a month of great sorrow and bittersweet joy as young William Ledger died at only 10 years of age uh, while a new son was born shortly thereafter. The new son was also named William uh, and the family remained at seven children. In March, 1778, William Ledger was appointed commander of the forts at New London and Groton and Stonington. And accordingly, he was promoted to the rank of major. As the revolution continued to swirl around them on, on January 6, 1780, William and Ann Ledger welcomed their eighth child into the world, son Henry Young's Ledger, as they also celebrated their 19th wedding anniversary. Their home on Pleasant Street must have been a lively place with so many voices raised. Uh, Anne would turn 36 years old in March. 1780 also brought William's promotion to Lieutenant Colonel. And then in September, in an unforeseen move that would later prove fatal to Ledger, a disgruntled Benedict Arnold defected to the British. Throughout 1780 and into 1781, the last year of his life, the British ships had regularly threatened the coast of Groton and New London as Ledger continued to struggle with improvements to the forts. Conditions in the area were terrible. Ledger's responsibilities included housing disease-stricken uh, British prisoners captured by New London privateers and disease was running rampant. Nathaniel Shaw complained, we are in such a wretched state in this town by reason of the smallpox, fever and famine that I cannot carry on my business. Sadly, Shaw's wife, Lucretia, died of smallpox, contracted after caring for the prisoners. The ledger himself was growing weary of the rampant disease and the shortages of men and supplies after six years now of, of war preparation. He had fired off an ongoing stream of letters to the governor, complaining, my duty has been and still is very fatiguing. In the summer of 1781, William and Anne's oldest daughter, uh, Mary Ann, married her first cousin, Thomas Seymour of Hartford, in July. Uh, but the joy of that celebration was soon crushed by great sadness when the amiable 16 year old Sarah Ledger died on July 26th. Anne was about eight months pregnant when she and William lost Sarah. Uh, a month later, son Charles Grover was born. Then just 11 days after Charles' birth, after months of British ships uh, threatening the southeastern Connecticut coast on and off, war finally arrived. And on September 6th, Groton was attacked. And William Ledger was killed in battle, along with over 80 massacred men and boys. At 42 years old, Ledger died just a short walk from his home. He had lived, worked, and fought the King of Great Britain in a very small world geographically. 
He could walk from one end to the other in minutes. You know, growing up, I've walked those same streets many times. Um, you can see on this image, the top ellipse is the original Ledger home. The middle ellipse is theoretically Colonel Ledger's house on Pleasant Street. And then the lower ellipse is of course, Fort Griswold. Um, very, very small area. But his world may have been small, but because he was a merchant, military man, and influential citizen, national and world turmoil found him on Groton Bank and for 20 years had pulled him into the American Revolution. Looking back through the history of his life, you know, I can return to my original question, you know, who was William Ledger, this merchant of Groton Bank? William Ledger was a man, you know, whose life story was uh, in a way written the day he was born. You know, his fate determined by privilege, paternal influence, geography, uh, his profession, uh, and the world events of his time. First and foremost, though, he was a good man and a beloved husband, married for over 20 years by September 1781. His wife, Anne, widowed at age 37, felt overwhelming grief after losing her husband. Uh, son Peter wrote in Anne's sad headstone inscription that his father's death left his mother despondent, aged beyond her years. A letter between family acquaintances speaking of the grieving Anne said all her hopes of happiness have been destroyed. She wishes for death as a kind friend and to shield her from the woes that have become too much for her to bear. Her husband had been a successful merchant a legislator and a capable leader of his community. Um, but one has to wonder whether Anne worried that, you know, with her husband about to go head to head with professionally trained British troops who had war experience, uh, she had to worry that William wasn't really a battle-hardened soldier. You know, although he trained with the Connecticut militia, I've yet to find evidence of him having been in any armed conflict before the Battle of Groton Heights. And I don't believe he was a, uh, even a rough and tumble seasoned mariner. You know, he was an onshore merchant, a businessman. Uh, this easygoing man of ex great executive ability was essentially an office manager, which I believe makes him uh, an even more remarkable hero. He may have been a man of civility. Uh, the one book he owned was Thompson Seasons, a book of poetry, but he was also a man of exceptional courage. He knew September 6th wasn't going to be a good day. As British warships were unloading soldiers at the mouth of the Thames, Ledger stepped onto the ferry in London for the trip back to Groton to defend Fort Griswold. He turned to those who were seeing him off and said, if I must lose today honor or life, you who know me can tell which it will be. He well knew what was coming. Revolution had framed his life and when war finally came to Groton Bank, American merchant William Ledger led his troops, fighting alongside his men, never flinching in the face of mortal danger knowing full well the consequence to his young family. That's what makes him a hero. That's his true legacy, I believe. And that's who William Ledger was. I hope that my writings on the Colonel's life will encourage a new and deeper understanding of the man so that remember, we remember the personal side of William Ledger, not simply that fatally wounded soldier frozen in time, you know, falling to the ground with a bloody vest as depicted in the big 12 by 16 foot David Wagner mural uh, installed in the lobby of the Groton Municipal Building. For we can't truly appreciate the depth of William Ledger's sacrifice until we understand his life and what that brave Groton merchant had to lose when he rose to the occasion in 1781. I'd like to thank you all for joining me today. And in closing, I'd like to thank the Connecticut Historical Society for hosting this program and for their assistance in the past. Their resources and professional staff have helped me to explore the life of uh, one of our state's signature heroes and provide what I've long seen as a missing piece of the local history, Southeastern Connecticut. Thank you very much. And I'll, I believe we have some time for questions uh, now and I'll, I'll put up my contact information briefly in case you have any questions in the future, please feel free to uh, contact me. John, thank you so much. That was amazing. Very enlightening to see all of the different pieces intertwined about his life and the times. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. 
Uh, Joan is asking if have you explored the connection between the ledgers and Dartmouth? Um, she's wondering if uh, Ledger sent any of his sons there uh, to learn under uh, Eb Eb Wheelock, uh, the founder, or did he have any trade dealings with Wheelock? You know, I, I did not. He was a friend of John Ledger was a friend of Wheelock. Um, I have not explored that, though I do know that uh, John's uh, John Ledger, the traveler, did go to uh, Dartmouth for a short time, but I guess he couldn't stand still for any length of time, so he was off and running shortly after that. Um, but I have not explored that yet, but that that is certainly on the list. Uh, lots of lots of different directions you can Absolutely. go in. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. Joan is also asking, uh, did the ledgers own any enslaved people? Did they import any enslaved people from the Caribbean? You know, they did. Um, I did find one record. Um, when I wrote the column on Ann Ledger and how she fared after William's death, uh, the census, New London census for 1790, her, the last year of her life, actually, um, the census showed she did own a slave. And uh, William Ledger's probate record does show that he also at that time owned a slave. Um, I don't know if it was the same one or not, but uh, yes, they were actually slave owners. And I, I, I was, I've always been surprised uh, after learning I that. Feel sorry. I, I, well, I was because that's, you know, I, I'm a proponent of what's oh, Somebody has their, uh, is unmuted. Perhaps we can mute. Uh, <laughs> okay, looks like we're muted. Sorry about that. Anyways, I, I think a lot of middle class Connecticut families did have a slave or two, and Anne was no exception. Right, this was not uncommon for the times at all, so mm -hmm. it's not a surprise. Um, Joan is also wondering what sort of a state um, is shown in his probate file. Any other information or illuminating finds? It, it was pretty. It's pretty fascinating to look at. Um, just just for the document, it is. Um, he did have the queen's wear I mentioned, and that was that was a fairly expensive uh, set of dinnerware and all that sort of thing. Um, he had a lot of regular household goods. He had wine glasses, beer glasses. Um, uh, it lists everything. It lists things like beds and linens and, and uh, furniture. Um, but th it almost seemed like Anne was downplaying it. She, she filed this in 1782, a year after, or months after his death. And she mentioned some things she called well-worn and well-used, um, you know, an old horse saddle and um, that leads to other questions. I've always wondered, and that's on my list of future projects, you know, what was he worth when he died? After being, being kind of beat up by all these trade regulations and having his business uh, impacted, and I, I wondered what did he, how, how well off was Anne? I know Anne lived a, an okay life. I, I suspect it was more middle class than wealthy. Um, so. But they also had a lot of children. <laughs> That's they did have, yeah, they did have nine children's total, nine right. children total. Um, but uh, I, I don't know that he was very wealthy, but that they, and you can't tell that. I haven't really delved into the probate record itself, line by line, to figure that out. Um, but he only had one book, and that always amazed me. Um, right, right. So that it's worth looking at. It, that's actually at the state library, and it's worth taking a peek at if you're interested. I, I find it fascinating to be that close to the, to them, to that family, to be able to see that probate record, right. and see what personal law. Uh, Joan is. They, up. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go right ahead. Um, Joan followed that up with: Was the store listed among the assets? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah. To just follow up on something John mentioned, um, especially in that last slide with the picture, um, the the painting of Colonel Ledger being uh, with the sword. Um, of course, uh, I have to plug a little for the Connecticut Historical Society. We do have in our collection, the shirt and waistcoat that he was wearing at the time of his death in the Battle of Groton Heights. 
So I am going to put the link in the chat if you wanted to, to see the item um, on our database that we have. Um, it's fascinating to see that that's, that's it. That's the real item of clothing he was wearing. Um, it has been cleaned. That is not something we, John and I were talking about um, who cleaned it. We're not quite sure on that, but that wouldn't be something collections would do today. Um, practice today would be that it would be preserved as it was. Um, so the blood stains were cleaned out of the waistcoat. Um, which I think is just a whole nother interesting conversation um, we could go down. But Angelina had a question. She was wondering, could Ledger have been involved in organizing ships to ferry Washington and his troops from New London to Long Island after chasing the British out of Boston? I think he well could have been. I, I haven't seen any evidence to that, but that's very likely. Um, and perhaps I, I hope to get into the relationship between Ledger and Shaw. And um, I could very well probably stumble upon that because um, Shaw was very, he would, he would be the man that I think Washington would go to for transportation like that. If he was a bigger outfit. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Anybody? I'm gonna just stop sharing for a minute. Anybody, anybody? Um, I had a couple of questions and now, of course, I didn't put them in the okay. chat. Jen, could I ask a question? Go ahead. Yeah, this is, uh, my name's Terry. Um, so was the town of Ledger named for him or his sons or how did that come about? Uh, that was in fact named for, for the Colonel. Okay, I kind of figured that, but I thought I'd ask because sometimes the kids, you know, carry on things differently. Yeah, Ledger was at one point part of Groton uh, until they, they broke off. And uh, yeah, they were, they did have him in mind uh, when they named the town. Good. Thank you. I, that was one of the things that I wanted to mention. <laughs> yep. uh, well, thank you so much, John, for your, um, for sharing um, yep. your work and a, a lot of research that you've done with us. Um, I just wanted to quickly, before we say goodbye to everyone, mention, can everyone see uh, my screen of upcoming programs? Um, we do have two programs um, on the horizon. One is uh, Saturday, October 16th. We have a poetry reading uh, from an Asian American poet, um, Deborah Kwan. And then on the 5th is our neck of November is our next coffee hour. Um, so true crimes in the museum. So we'll look at some items uh, in our collection that tell some interesting stories about crime or other bad things that people did. <laughs> but thank you so much uh, for joining us today. We um, look forward to seeing you at our next Lunch and Learn. We have one coming at the end of November as well. And thank you again to John. This was great. And uh, if you have some more research that you've done and can add more to your story, please come on back and share with us some more. We'll do, thank you so much for having me. Great, thank you everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm just uh, moving some people to the waiting room. That's sure, sure. Still here. All right, that was great. Thank you oh, so much. Thank you so much. You know, I was worried because I, I had so much information.